While I took off two years from board service, I worked just as hard to help pass the last East Lost for education, to successfully meet our students where they were with what they needed, whether academic, athletic, artistic, or autistic. And I proudly worked to ensure the students of District 7 got our brand new technology, technologically advanced William Henry Spencer High School, my alma mater. I look forward to talking with you this evening and taking your questions. Again, thank you all for being here. I'm Kathy Williams, District 7 School Board member. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, and next I am going to um, unmute uh, your challenger and introduce Dr. Walter Taylor. Um, and he is challenging Kathy Williams in District 7. Thanks for being here, sir. Good evening and thank you so much again. As already said, thank you so much to the Muscogee County Democrats for hosting uh, this forum tonight. Uh, good evening to everyone who is in attendance. My name is Walter Taylor, and I am a candidate for the upcoming election for District 7 representative for the Muscogee County School Board. As a senior pastor and business owner and resident of District 7, I constantly see the need to redress the educational and literary needs of our community. Literacy and education are the building blocks for shaping our community into becoming hubs for successful young adults who will become and grow to become productive members of our society. District 7 is very interesting because it is uh, diverse ethnically and socially. I believe that I am the voice to bridge the gaps that exist within this district. Having been educated in District 7, I can relate to all aspects of the culture. I will not only be the voice of the highly educated business professional, the college educated mother, but also the voice of the single parent with three children, the working parents with multiple jobs trying to make ends meet, and the parent of the child who has a disability or diagnosis of mental illness. I believe that I have the responsibility to serve as that voice for my neighbors and for my friends so all the youth of District 7 will receive the highest quality of education attainable. I believe that my voice is needed to help ensure that the children of District 7 receive the funding and the resources to make that a reality in this new and upcoming decade. Thank you again for having me. Thank you very much for that statement. Um, let's see, next I'd like to introduce um, Sherry Aaron and who is our candidate for, is it District 4? Three. Three, okay, sorry. Um, thank you for being here. Okay. Thank you for having me again. I want to say thank you for having us. I think this is an amazing forum. I watched a couple of your other forums and I thought they were absolutely great. Um, my name is Sherry Aaron. I am originally from Oakland, California. I'm a mother of two daughters. Um, I'm retired military. Uh, I have 14 children currently in Muscogee County schools that we are responsible for. I have two residential programs, which I named in honor of my mother who passed away when I was just one years old. Um, full-time, I'm sorry, this is my very first forum. I was told not to say it, but I'm going to tell you all anyway, okay? This is my very first forum. I'm get, learning to get comfortable in, in, in speaking and answering questions and presenting myself, okay? So, I, like I said, I am a uh, mother of two children in Muscogee County School District. I'm an entrepreneur of several successful businesses here in Columbus, Georgia. I have a, two residential programs, which are um, residential programs for girls. We have a total of 12 children in our program. So all of them attend Muscogee County School District schools. I am very active with them um, academically, and um, some of them do play sports as well. They're, they're excellent children. Um, I was raised by my grandmother. Like I said, my mother passed away when I was just one years old. Uh, after high school, I went on to join the military. I spent about eight years in the military. I medically retired from there. Um, I started my family while in the military. Uh, we moved here to Columbus, Georgia in 2008. My husband is 20 year retired. Um, I'm sorry, what were you gonna say? Oh, slow down. 
Um, after high school, I entered the military where I served my country for eight years. I started my family there. We got here in 2008. Um, I absolutely love Columbus, Georgia. Um, I love the schools that my children currently attend. They don't t attend any, any schools in my district because of the way they're zoned, but they do attend schools here in Columbus, Georgia, in Muskogee County School District, where I am involved. I have a lot of children that go to school at district number seven, actually. <laughs> um, downtown, that's one of your schools, right, Miss Kathy? Yeah, one of my daughters, she's actually going from being promoted to the sixth grade this year um, from your school. I've seen firsthand the need for engagement and involvement from parents who can offer valuable insight when key decisions are being made concerning our children's education by the school board. When I'm elected, I plan to be present at every turn for every voter, just as I am today. My hope is this evening that you get a chance to know me. Um, I'm very approachable. As I was meeting with a lot of my neighbors, they stated that um, they would like for someone to represent them who's accessible, approachable, and that is me. That is why I see, that's why I'm seeking the seat so that I can represent my district and be present and be available. My name is Sherry Aaron. I pray that, you know, all goes well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, let me commend all of you because um, I can only imagine the, the bravery that it takes to step up and say, I, I want to serve and I'm going to be a public person here. And, um, and put yourself out there. So I, I've i never done that. So um, y'all are ahead of me in that regard. So thank you so much for, for doing it, for being out here to serve um, our families here in Muskogee County. Um, you were saying that you're from Oakland. Well, that's where I had my first child in the Naval Hospital at, in Oakland because we're military as well. So we ended up here in Columbus and um, we've been here quite, quite a bit. But anyway, enough about me. I'm keeping you unmuted, um, Sherry, just for, just to move on to our first question, and um, I'll start with you. And that is, if you had m lots of money to spend, if the budget was vast, what's your wish list for the district? You know, what is it that you would want to um, establish here? Well, there's one thing that's already kind of in the works, and I'm, I wish that it would continue and, and be successful is the com combination of Dawson and St. Mary's Road Elementary Schools. That is literally at the top of my wish list. Beyond that, uh, new buses, <laughs> new buses. <laughs> okay, okay, great. I'm going to, um, Dr. Taylor, I'm going to pin you and unmute you and ask, sorry. and ask you the same question. What's on your wish list? Uh, on my wish list would be a comprehensive plan and implementation of programs that enable single parents to become more involved in their child's education, uh, bridging that gap, addressing some of these socioeconomical issues that are facing our community um, and addressing and implementing programs for parents who struggle with literacy so that they are able to, when their child is at home, able to render the aid needed uh, for their child when they are outside of the classroom. Um, those programs are at the top of my wish list. Great, thank you very much. Um, let's see. And now, There we go, okay. unmuted. <laughs> and Kathy Williams, thank you. So on my wish list, um, first Sherry, uh, buses that are air conditioned <laughs> and heated with operational cameras, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Oh, you know, wow. our bus uh, fleet is aging. And one of the only forms of funding that we have to utilize to purchase buses is our East Lost dollars. So it's so critical that we continue to support our SPLOS so that, Sherry, you can get your wish list. Dr. Taylor, you can get your wish. On my wish list, uh, things are changing rapidly in our community, in our society, in our world. And so my wish list has evolved over the last several weeks, two months, 
Um, right now, I wish every child in not only District 7, but in Muskogee County, had all the resources that they needed to be successful, beyond successful. I wish every child had two engaged parents at home that was able to work with them every night with their homework. I wish that, um, I wish that every child in Muskogee County had the digital learning assets and the connectivity needed to enter this new century of uh, distance learning. I don't think it's going to go away anytime real soon. And my sincerest wish is that we will have enough funding to ensure every student has the ability to take advantage of what educational opportunities we can, we can offer them in this new era. Thank you very much. Um, now I'm going to keep you unmuted uh, just for convenience sake and, and start with the second question that we had from the Muskogee Dems. And that is, what do you think is the single biggest, biggest challenge to success um, that, that's facing the Muskogee County um, School District right now? And what kind of proposal do you have for solving it? So um, again, you know, I, we're, we're victims of what's going on right now. Biggest challenge, unquestionably, is the pending, looming budgetary cuts that are coming from the state of Georgia. Um, we, we were so close, we were so close to kind of getting over what the last Great Recession did to our district. We were just that close to getting everything that we wanted five years ago, seven years ago, today, um, and this is going to set us back. Let, let nobody be fooled. This is going to set us back. I thought that th during the Great Recession, I thought that was the most difficult budgetary process I'd ever been through. I honestly believe that these next two years are going to be even more challenging, uh, more, uh, more difficult to ensure that we do provide that equity that I have committed my, my um, entire public service on the school board to. Um, but I promise, I promise all the voters of District 7, if and when I'm reelected, I will fight to the end to make sure that District 7 has that equitable um, uh, 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 resources that, that all our schools will need. But it's, that's the biggest challenge, period. Yeah, I would have to agree. Um, hearing that through all of our forums, you know, the funding that that our state passes down, you know, through sales tax, through everything is going to be so, so limited. So um, thank you very much. And let me now unmute um, Sherry and can you, you're still, let me see. Okay, you're, you're ready. So what, what do you think is the biggest challenge that faces the Muskogee County School District and how would you solve it? Right now, I think the biggest challenge that we face is, is our current pandemic, um, COVID-19, and it's really getting our children back to school. Um, once they get back to school, social distancing, um, there were several opportunities uh, as far as connecting a techno technology. I know Mr. Taylor talked a little bit earlier about parents not being able to have or understanding technology is how I, you know, how I received what he had said. And I think that's very important is to be able to get our parents and our students to be able to understand how to use the technology in situations like this. And once we go back to school, social distancing, um, I'm committed to work with the other board members if I'm elected in figuring out how to come up with creative ways to, to manage COVID-19 in the schools as far as additional testing or whatever ideas or that's put out there from the CDC or we come up with collectively just really to get our children back to school. Yeah, I think everyone's wondering. It's such a such a world of uncertainty right now. Um, but yeah, that is going to really be a, a challenge to get a plan in place for that. So thank you very much. Um, and Dr. Taylor, I'm waiting for you to um, unmute and there you go. What do you think about the biggest challenge? 
um, I, I, I must mirror uh, and say exactly what has already been said. The greatest challenge before us right now is the pandemic. However, uh, let me piggyback on that in my short time. Um, this pandemic only adds insult to the injury of the social economic issues that are already and have already been in place within District 7. And so it just worsens the problems that a lot of the citizens of District 7 have already been facing. Um, and so it is imperative that going forward, um, we begin to uh, reach out and develop partnerships with other organizations because of the budgetary cuts that are coming down from the state. It's imperative that organizations uh, become partnered with our local schools so that the schools are able to foster the environments that are suitable for education. Uh, we definitely don't know what the new norm would look like. However, it is a, it, it's our part and, and, and it's our responsibility to make sure that our students and our teachers and principals have the resources that are needed uh, to prepare the children for what the, the current new or the new would look like as it pertains to education. Agreed. That's, um, uh, there, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of questions that I already have because of what you guys have been saying, but I want to let our, I'm going to hold back. Um, thank you very much for that though, Dr. Taylor. Um, I'm going to hold back because I'm going to now um, offer um, the audience a chance to ask any questions. If you have a question, go down to the to wherever you see it's either at the bottom or the top of your screen where it says chat and you can click on that and just write the word correct question. And if you would like to um, ask it in person, I will just unmute you in the order which you have written question. If you would just like to type out the question and you'd like me to ask it, I'm happy to do that as well. So our first question is from someone that you all probably know, and that's Mike Edmondson. And let me see, I'm unmuting you, Mike. Let me, I'll let you know when it's ready. Okay, Mike, what is your question? Okay, well, I was typing it in just to ask. Um, oh. he hello there, hello everyone. Uh, it's nice to nice to see you. I'm leaving my video off because I think it would be a distraction. Um, you know, you know, quarantine hair, that sort of thing. Um, my question is this: What uh, specific way or ways, I guess, Dr. Taylor, would you uh, increase parental involvement? Uh, specific, not a general uh, ideas, but specific ways. It's real difficult. I've found to get people, um, even when they're concerned about their children, to get involved. And I just wanted to know what, what you might envision as, a, as specific ways. Uh, some of the specific ways in which I have uh, considered and do envision is creating programs that call for the parent and the child to work together. Uh, one of the realities of uh, the situation before us is times have changed. Uh, and the way that we did things when I was in school, uh, the arithmetic is, is not the same way anymore. So it, becomes, it can become discouraging for parents to assist children uh, in learning or in homework when they don't understand it themselves. So implementing programs uh, that allow the, the parent and the child to come in and work together hand in hand um, that is one way to increase parental involvement, uh, given opportunities to allow the parent to come into the schools uh, on volunteer basis, um, to become more engrafted into uh, working with one-on-one -on -one with the children uh, in the classroom will help to increase parental involvement. Uh, holding parents more accountable will increase parental involvement. Um, these are just some of the ways that uh, have already uh, began to work with some of the programs that we have here at the Life Center for, as it pertains to our youth program and how we, it allows our parents to become involved in the things that their children do within the community of District 7. Thank you, sir. And if I can follow, if, if Ms. Walker, if I can follow it up with one, one question. On the parent accountability, 
part of that, uh, you know, I certainly couldn't agree with you more. How can you hold parents more accountable? There are a couple of ways that I believe we can envision in doing this um, is sending uh, descriptive notices home, asking the parent to not only sign the notice, but rather to bring the notice back in person to the school. Um, there is a uh, creating more flexibility for communication um, will help to hold the parents more responsible. Um, before school hours, after school hours, now that this pandemic has forced the education arena into uh, the technological era, taking advantage of technology, i.e. what we're on now, Zoom, it gives the ability for parents who say, well, I can't leave my job. Well, you have lunch break, meet me on a Zoom session at lunch. And now we have the parental involvement as it pertains to their child's education. We have to take advantage of social media and the internet during this age, this age. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your answer. Thank you. You're welcome, well. sir. Thank, thank you, well. Dr. Taylor. I'm sure. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I wanted to give our other challenger, um, Sherry Ms. Aaron, um, a chance that to to elaborate if there was any any other ideas that you had about that question. There is an idea that I have. Okay, so I've been going around my neighborhoods and I've been speaking to all of my neighbors. I think that, um, well, no, I don't think that. What I'm going to do is once I'm elected, I'm going to have monthly forums, possibly in their neighborhoods, where I'm easily accessible for them to come and we can talk about different issues. A lot of the parents that I've spoken to, they don't have access to technology. So they had a challenge with those Zoom meetings and stuff. A lot of them, if their child wasn't sitting home with those Chromebooks, they didn't have access to it. A lot, of, a lot of them don't have even the smartphones. I know we live in a day and age where everyone has those smartphones and those cool iPhones and things like that, but a lot of the parents that I was able to go out and speak to, they don't have, they don't, they don't have those, those things to be able to, to kind of get on those meetings and things like that. But I would like to build relationships with my, my neighbors so they can understand that I'm here for them. I'm here to answer any questions any concerns and assist them through any issues. A lot of times parents, what I'm noticing is what I want to speak on. What I'm noticing is the parents, they may not have certain educational levels to where they don't feel confident in speaking to uh, persons that are at the schools or even speaking to, um, speaking to persons, I'll just leave it there exactly where it's at, speaking to people. So what I want to do is I want to let them know that you know, I'm accessible. You can speak to me. We can build a relationship so that I can help you through any issues that you may have with your child at our schools. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and Kathy, do you have anything um, that you would like to add? Yes, I, I would. Um, you know, District 7 is a very diverse district, and a lot of our parents, as I mentioned earlier, all our schools are Title I schools. All of our parents uh, struggle with being able to engage in their child's uh, public education, whether it's because they're not working one job, but they're working two or two and a half or three jobs, or because they don't particularly understand the new math and they don't uh, particularly understand how that translates into uh, teaching. So one of the things that our schools in District 7 have done very successfully to counter that, because you can say we need to hold our parents more accountable, but what our schools in District 7 have said is they've kind of turned that paradigm and said, we need to give our families and our students new tools to be able to be successful. So we're seeing more and more of our um, District 7 schools implement uh, educational enrichment programs after school. So instead of parks and recreation having their after school care, the schools themselves, the teachers and the educators in that school and in that community are staying with those students after school. They're doing mentoring, they're doing um, tutoring, they're doing an enrichment programs, they're reinforcing what's taught during the day. And that is one tool 
that we've seen really be effective on helping those students close that achievement gap. Great, thank you. Thanks for adding that on. Um, I'm going to, let's see, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna keep you unmuted just because you may, if, if this question pertains to you, you can be the first one to answer it. Um, Harry Underwood, one of our post committee members, he has a question he would like to ask. Go ahead, Harry. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, th this is Harry Underwood, um, and I, and so I wanted to ask about a particular uh, item of the uh, of Georgia law and everything. It's um, OCGA twenty dash two dash one one eight one. Uh, saying that it shall be unlawful for any person to knowingly, intentionally, or recklessly disrupt or interfere with the operation of any public school, public school bus, or public school bus stop as designated by local school boards of education. Any person violating this code section shall be guilty of a misdemeanor of a high and aggravated nature. And so, end quote, that, uh, so that, uh, I wanted to bring that up because in a number of states, including uh, Texas, um, South Carolina, and most recently Virginia this year, they uh, curtailed their own provision, similar laws and everything on disturbing school to no longer apply to students in their own school. Um, because in those other states, they previously were considered as students who were in their own school and were charged with being a, um, with disturbing school, could be charged with a felony or an aggravated misdemeanor. And so uh, they no longer apply that to the students in their own school. So in the absence of, of a, a similar change here in Georgia law regarding that because of the racist aspects of that law, especially after the 1960s, um, and using some of the laws to attack uh, students who are doing stuff like sit-ins and what have you. Is that something that as members of the Board of Education you can do or what would you be able to do to try to like reduce the aspect of this law and everything that criminalizes uh, students being themselves in their own school? Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Okay, Kathy, to you. Okay. Um, I'm not familiar with that law, um, Harry, so you'll have to forgive me if I can't talk to the particulars of it, but I, I can talk at, at a little bit third, higher 30,000 uh, foot level. We have a very comprehensive um, manual that teachers are, or that students and their parents are given at the beginning of every school year that really lays out what we consider an infraction, an infraction of behavior. And um, we allow as much as possible within the, within the confines of the law to allow local rule for implementing some of those, uh, most, of those most of those disciplinary actions. Now there are some things we have zero tolerance, weapons is one. You know, if, if, you, if you bring a gun to school or a knife, you know, not just a pen knife, but a knife, um, we, you are going to be turned over to the Columbus Police Department. We do not have uh, any say on that, it's zero tolerance. But for the rest of the time, almost uh, across the board, it's really up to the teachers, the guidance counselors, the, the school psychologists, the principal, to really determine what the intent of the infraction was. You know, was there really an intention to do harm? Was there really an intention to commit a crime. And since we've been able to really allow our principals more local rule, we've seen those, we've seen those numbers come way down. One of the things that I worked on when I came back on the board four years ago was the number of school, in school and out of school suspensions was way too high. I mean, you can't teach a child if they're not in the classroom. And so Dr. Lewis and the administration really went to work on trying to figure out what we have to do to keep our children in school. That doesn't mean you charge them with a misdemeanor and throw them out, okay? What it means is that you put in positive behavior um, uh, programs that help them understand what, what the, the implications are to their behavior. And once they get to understand it, then you start to see behavior change. And that's really, kind of where I come from, is what you want to do is, one, you want to help them understand what their behavior is doing, both negative both and positive, and then you want to really reinforce that positive side. We've seen those numbers come way down, um, and, and I'm proud of that work. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, 
Dr. Taylor, let me unpin you next and unmute you or pin you and unmute you. Um, what, what feedback do you have on that question? Um, I, I, I do agree that uh, a lot of latitude should be given to the administrators of the schools uh, to uh, make discretionary actions and disciplinary actions concerning ch children. However, one of the things that I believe is most important and a lot of attention needs to be paid to in this 21st century is educating um, faculty to understand the difference between behavioral issues and mental health issues. Um, because there has been a serious uh, infraction to individuals. They have been labeled as having behavioral issues when in fact there is a mental health disorder and diagnosis uh, that if the faculty, the teachers, the principals would have known, then the situation could have been handled entirely different. I believe that uh, one of the main streams on my radar is to bring redress to uh, the mental health awareness and uh, that's going on within Muskogee County. Um, because when it is that a child is acting out, uh, is this child acting out because they have a behavior problem or is this child acting out because of a trigger and they have a PTSD diagnosis? And so we have to be able to differentiate between what's going on with this child. I believe that when we can do those things, then we would see a, a lessening in the suspension rate. Thank you. I think that's a really excellent point, something to um, for teachers to always keep in mind. And I would hope that that would be a part of information that they would get when they have you know, children in uh, but that's easier in elementary school, I guess, when you probably have a smaller group and we have a larger um, population of high school students that are coming in and out of your class, that would be more difficult. But, um, but thank you very much. Right. And now, um, Ms. Erin, um, would you like to, and I'm still on, it's still saying you're mute. There you go. Would you like to um, add anything, please? I would just like to add that in my programs, I work with several children that have a mental health diagnoses. Um, and I have personal children that are very close to me that also so have those. But I do want to say that there is a need to keep all of our children safe. And while I'm also not familiar with the law that we're referencing right now, when I'm elected, I'm going to do all the research I can and, and get with other board members and, and learn from them, you know, such as Ms. Kathy, I'm listening to her, and I think what she said was, was, was great. She's very seasoned, and she understands what she's talking about. But I also, you know, once I get with them and we discuss different things, I do have a voice, and I will give my input on, on certain things, but there is a need to keep all of our children safe. So whatever that law is that I'm going to, once I'm done uh, with the form, I'm going to do my research tonight and, and, you know, and read about it and try to learn about it. But there is a great need to keep our children, to keep our children safe. Thank you, and, and just FYI to um, those of you on the call, Harry linked the, um, the web, the, a, a website that uh, describes and, and you know, cites that law. So if you wanna go over and just uh, download it while, we're, um, while you're not answering, you'll be able to have that right there. So thanks, Harry. Thank you very much um, to uh, Sherry. Okay, we have um, a question from, uh, Leanna Feggins, to all of you. And so Sherry, I'll keep you unmuted and you can answer first. Um, it is, what are your plans to ensure that students with an IEP have that access to one-on-one -on -one education with their teachers if schools were to remain closed? Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. You must have automatically muted because I didn't touch it. Let me. Okay, there we go. I'm unmuted. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. All right. So right now, during the pandemic, we're we're able to utilize uh, the Zoom. I think that if this is going to if this is going to be a prolonged situation, that the children with IEPs need to especially have these technology this technology. They need to have these computers, you know, maybe sent to their homes or or dropped off, or if their parents are able to pick them up to pick them up because they can do the the Zoom meetings, you know, right now with their with their with their teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Taylor, let me 
Okay, how would you um, how would you address that? Uh, one one of the ways that we can address this is via phone conference and, uh, as she said, using tech technology, Zoom meetings, things of those calibers. Um, however, bridging the gap and creating and partnering with programs and resources within the community uh, to enable the children to get the necessary resources if they aren't able to, let's say per se, because I know residents of District 7 that don't have internet access, so if they aren't able to have the Zoom meetings, partnering with organizations within the community that are still able to give and meet um, the standards of that, what, that are outlined in that IEP. Um, again, with this pandemic, it has forced us to create a new norm um, as it pertains to distant learning and education as a whole. So I think it's important that we begin to lay the parameters of what that would look like as it pertains to addressing uh, IEPs. Thank you very much. Um, and then Kathy, I just unmuted you. Um, and what is your take on that? Because I know, um, especially, you know, special education teachers have been very stretched trying to give the individual attention that they usually are able to give in the classroom. Yeah, special education teachers is one of the areas that uh, this administration worked incredibly hard to try to close the gap of um, those open positions because it's a specialty that is in such demand throughout the country. I mean, Columbus is not unique to that. Um, but one of the things that we've done in Muskogee County is we've been real creative, both in how to, how to recruit to the, for those positions, as well as uh, really ensuring that we show our appreciation in their paychecks. We augment our special education teachers with bonuses. Um, we're one of the few districts in uh, Georgia that do that, and I think we're actually one of the top paying uh, districts in the area for uh, special needs teachers. And that has helped us close that, that uh, uh, open gap. But, you know, I'd like to also talk a little bit about what we've done over the past two years with our PES department, where we've really, um, our special education department and, and, and specialists have really worked on what we call a continuum. So that it, it goes from you know, a child, a student that uh, is just having a bad day, okay? It's just having a bad day and just needs a little bit extra attention all the way to that student that is uh, nonverbal, that uh, it, it needs one-on-one -on -one attention all the time and everything in between. And, and we've brought in, um, you know, a, partnerships that have allowed those students to get the amount of attention that is needed for where they are. And again, I you know, started out when I, when I opened my comments with talking about meeting the child where they are to ensure we get them what they need. And that's child by child. And working on this continuum for our behavioral, um, ch for children with behavioral problems, <clears throat> everything from uh, attention deficit to PTSD to, uh, to the various, uh, uh, various uh, levels of the spectrum of autism. The autism wings that we've put into every level of our schools that allow us to de-escalate um, an autistic child's meltdown to make sure that we get them the wraparound services that are needed so that we can stabilize them and, and then re-engage them back into mainstream schools. We have gone, we've just, we've, we've gone leap years in being able to provide for these students. And, you know, it, it, you see it not only, you, you see it, I remember the father this year that came to us and said, you know, the best thing that had ever happened was my, my, my son, got involved in this program, you saved his life. And, and he teared up at the podium of our school meeting, of our board meeting. You know, we don't usually get that. We get the people who come down and talk about everything we're doing wrong. 
But when it comes to special education, the dyslexia programs that we're now implementing are life-changing to our students that suffer from dyslexia that often were misdiagnosed as behavioral problems. That's changing their lives. And, and we, have these, we have these amazing professionals that are focused, laser focused, on our special needs children and making just all the difference in the world for them. That is so good to hear, so good to know. Um, thank you very much for that. Thanks for those examples. Um, we, I want to ask everyone, if you have a question, please either write question in the chat box or write out your question. Um, right now, we only have one more. Um, so if you have a question, now's the time to get it in. Um, I'm going to, um, let's see. Again, since you're unmuted already, Kathy, the, this last question is, um, what ideas would you suggest to help create a better relationship between African-American young men in District 7? And I'm going to include District uh, 3 as well because it's, you know, uh, relevant. Um, law enforcement and diverse communities, um, especially, so between the young African-American men and law enforcement, um, especially after the recent shooting catastrophe of Ahmad Arbery. Yes, um, you know, this is something that has always been near and dear to my heart. As a graduate of Spencer High School, I, I you know, I can remember back in the 70s, the intense friction, racial friction that occurred in our schools. And now we're seeing it throughout the community. And, and what we've done, both through our PBI system, the, the behavior, positive behavioral support systems within the schools, but we've also, which, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're working with all law enforcement agencies on how to de-escalate, how to talk to students, because it's different in a school environment. You know, a police officer, whether they're one of ours or a sheriff or what, whatever, um, whatever arm they're coming from, talking to a student in a school that's got some tension going on is completely different than in the community and making sure that every one of our law enforcement uh, officers that are in our schools now have the highest level of training, but also working with the other officers in the police department, sheriff's department on how to de-escalate, how to, for, for example, um, a de-escalation for an autistic child is completely different than de-escalation of a child who's angry that is totally different from a de-escalation of a child who has been bullied and feels their life is threatened. And you know what? I, I don't know that that's black or white. I really think that's just all of our students. And we have to make sure that the police that are in our schools, whether they're our own or our communities, understand and respect because that's how they're going to earn the understanding and respect from our students. And when our students begin to have a mutual respect with our law enforcement officers, you're gonna start seeing you know, a lot better relationships as those young men become adult men because they, they will have fostered that relationship from an early age. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to go to Ms. Aaron and then, and then back to our finish up with Dr. Taylor. So let's do that. Um, let's see. Okay, you're unmuted, um, Sherry. So if you could talk a little bit about um, fostering a better relationship between law enforcement and our young men. I believe that it's about building bridges uh, with law enforcement, with, with the children, learning how to communicate with them, speaking to them on their level to where they understand and they become comfortable with you. My husband was a police officer here in Columbus, Georgia. He did a lot of community policing a little bit too with our community, with our boys in our neighborhood. They learned him, they got comfortable with him. When they had issues, they were able to approach him um, and, they made, and he made them feel comfortable to where it's not always um, aggressive. So a lot of times what we're seeing is the relationship between our young men and our young ladies, because again, I have residential programs for young ladies and they are very aggressive as well. So the relationship 
building the relationship is very important. Being um, in the communities, the police officers and sheriff's departments and just law enforcement as a whole being present in our communities, not only when there's a problem to make our children feel comfortable. I think that that's somewhere that we should, we should start. Agreed, thank you very much. Okay, and Dr. Taylor, you are unmuted. Thank you so much. Um, I think the most appropriate way that I can answer this uh, question that is before us is from the spectrum of being an African American in the 21st century. Um, as a black man, um, I, I can tell you that uh, it is, it creates tension when it is that you are approached by a law enforcement official. I am a well-educated black man. I am a, a, a prominent black man within the community. Yet when I am approached by law enforcement, I have to reconcile in my thinking um, how to communicate this uh, situation that is now before me. I think that we have to educate our young black men, one, on who they are as African Americans, teaching them their history, letting them understand that they do not have to be um, statistics of the environment in which they come from, letting them know that they have been gifted and grafted to be more than what any stigma may have tried to be placed onto them, um, teaching them conflict resolution, teaching them how to de-escalate situations. But then also, as I've communicated with Chief uh, the chief down at the police department, it's imperative that our law enforcement officials, as Sherry said, do more community policing, come out into our neighborhoods during times of peace when there is no conflict so that our young people and our young men especially will begin to understand how to communicate and talk to law enforcement officials. Uh, we have to stop the profiling and the racism that exists within this city. As a black man here just in this campaign alone, I have saw it myself. So I know that it exists and it is a challenge for young men in the school system who have not been educated on how to handle themselves in, type, in these types of situations. And so I believe it's important that we cultivate uh, forums, that we cultivate uh, mentorship programs that teach young men how to become uh, productive men in our community. Thank you very much. I know that um, the, those intentions are our utmost and um, I, I just I know it's all of our wish that these things could come to pass and be effective for larger groups because I've seen a lot of different outreach um, just through just in the Muskogee Democrats um, a lot of our members are involved with different things and it just needs to be more um, so anyway I appreciate that thank you um, I have it looks like we, I just have a follow-up um, question specifically for um, Ms. Williams as a current serving uh, board member regarding the IEP question. So I'm going to um, unmute you and just ask her follow-up, but then I'll just ask you to go into your closing statements and then we'll go to um, uh, Dr. Taylor and then finish up with Ms. Aaron. Um, and what the follow-up is, is that she was more curious as to what programs are in place now for individuals who struggle with not having in-person communication. Um, you know, that even though we have this pandemic challenge, that some of the children with IEPs, you know, just a remote learning isn't really isn't really cutting it as far as quality for them. And she's asking you to follow up on that, if you could. I'm not sure exactly how to follow up, uh, you know, other than what I've said. I do know that we are uh, monitoring our IEPs. That has not stopped. Uh, we're still administering um, the programs necessary to ensure that the IEPs are being met. Uh, we have provided the Chromebooks to all, I think, all of our students with IEPs 
that don't have, didn't have them before, because we had already rolled them out to our high schools and our middle schools. But, uh, but I know that we've also um, rolled them out to um, some of our special needs children. So, you know, I know the staff is monitoring IEPs. They're, they're still required to adhere to them. Uh, we're using such as this, we're using video conferencing, you know, phone, uh, phone counseling, what really whatever we can under the, you know, the strict guidelines that we have to adhere to of not being able to be, you know, person to person. So we're, we're, we're doing as much as I can. Now, I, that's not to say that there's nobody or no situation that hasn't fallen through the cracks. And if that's the case, give me a call, reach out to me, let me know, let me then make sure that the people within the administration know that's our job as, as school board members is to be that liaison for our parents that may feel um, not comfortable to try to contact the administration directly. And that's uh, one of the joys of this job is to being able to help my constituents with their personal issues that they may have with our district. Great. I think that's a great uh, suggestion. I was going to offer that myself to definitely reach out. You're very accessible. So thank you very much. Okay. So what would you like to say in closing, uh, Kathy? Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Democrats. Um, uh, I appreciate, again, you putting this together for us. So I'm Kathy Williams. I'm a mother and co-mother of four adult children and two amazing grandchildren. <laughs> I have lived, worked, played, and prayed in District 7 for decades. I'm the pr a proud graduate of William Henry Spencer High School and president and CEO of NeighborWorks Columbus, a nonprofit housing organization that I have led for over 20 years. As a member of the District 7 schools team, because that's what we are, we're, we're just part of a team. It has been a joy to work with District 7 principals and watch their extraordinary accomplishments over the past four years. I've watched their CC RPI scores or climate score ratings but both move upward in every one of our schools and have enjoyed the creativity that they have all shown to engage our students and their families. I believe in meeting every child where they are and supporting what they need to be successful, whether it's academic, athletic, artistic, or autistic. And I'm asking for the support from the District 7 voters to return me to the position so that I can continue the work because there is still a lot of work to be done. Thank you, Laura. You're welcome, Kathy. Thank you for being here. Um, next, I'm going to... Um, Dr. Taylor, the floor is yours for your closing statement. Thank you so much again to the Democrat uh, for host, hosting this forum tonight. Uh, it has been an absolute joy. Uh, again, I am uh, Walter Taylor. Uh, I am a citizen. I am a pastor. I'm a business owner. I'm a parent. Uh, I'm a husband. I'm all of those things. But most of all, I'm a part of District 7, born and raised in District 7. Uh, I hurt when I see uh, the children of District 7 not have the uh, necessities that they need to be productive in their academia. It grieves my heart that we don't have some of the same resources that other schools have. And so because of such, I am coming out uh, this election to uh, secure the seat for representation of District 7 on Muscogee County School Board so that I can fight to get the resources that are needed to better the schools in District 7, to better the environment, to better uh, the workload and uh, get qualified teachers into our schools in District 7 so that we can become that beacon of hope and that beacon of light like other schools around this state. And so I'm excited uh, to be that voice for the citizens of District 7. I'm excited to represent the people of District 7. So I need your help and your support in this upcoming collection. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. It was great to get to meet you in, as much oh, in person God. as we can. Um, and now, uh, finally, thank you, um, Ms. Erin, for joining us tonight. And let us, as soon as it switches over, there we go. Um, please give us your closing statement. Again, I thank you for allowing me to, to share this platform. 
Um, prayerfully, you all have learned a little bit about me this evening. You know that um, that I'm eager to, to serve in district number three. Also, not just our district, but all the children of Muscogee County. I am also a mother of two beautiful daughters, but I also mother another 12 in uh, my residential programs. I'm a wife and I'm also a veteran. Uh, I have a three-tier program, a plan, I'm, I'm sorry, a three-tier plan uh, once I'm elected to, to implement building, building bridges, uh, being a co collaborative member who is committed to reviewing all information and working alongside other board members to make decisions that provide the best education for all Muscogee County students, breaking barriers, being an active vocal participant on the school board, advocating for the resources for parents, educators, and children, boldly taking a stand for education. I am not a politician, and the education of our children should not be a game of politics nor popularity. It's time for representation that is actively engaged and present on a daily basis. Again, I can't say it enough. What I've heard as I visited my neighbors is that we don't have anyone that is accessible in our district. And I plan to be accessible once I'm elected so that I can be able to help our families and neighbors and, and listen to them and help them through whatever issues they may have. I'm a parent and like I said, I have children in Muscogee County School District. So I hear firsthand, you know, and I'm a, I'm a part of things that are in the schools and my children, they, they bring things to me and I'm able to go in and, and work through whatever issues they have. And I wanna have my parents to understand that I will help them work through the same thing. So again, my name is Sherry Aaron. You know, prayerfully, like I said, you guys have learned me and you will welcome me with open arms and I have your support and prayerfully your vote on June 9th. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Aaron. Thanks for being here. It was great to get to meet you as well. Okay, everyone, um, we will, we have videotaped, we have videotaped, you know, get the VHS out. We have recorded this um, <laughs> session, so we will um, post that on our Facebook page and I'll send it out to our candidates just so that you can uh, take a look and share or whatever you would like to do with it. Um, thank you all so much for being here as candidates. We, we also, I want to mention that Vanessa Jackson, as we talked about at the beginning of the um, evening, uh, she could not be with us tonight due to uh, her work schedule, but I'm thinking that she will be able to attend, or I hope so, at the, the forum that's scheduled next week through the AKAs, the Deltas, the Links, the, um, in the Ministerial Alliance, and uh, Urban League, Young Professionals. So um, we'll share that as well, uh, that information, so everyone can check that out. And thank you to all who, who attended tonight, who, are, who care about your um, your you know, it, you don't have to be a parent to, to care about the school board. You, um, a school is in, public schools are important, are vital, are actually the fundamental building blocks of our society, in my opinion. And so they, you know, when people say, well, I don't want to pay taxes, I don't have any kids in school. I, I just, that, that reasoning is so faulty and we all know why. It's just, um, it, it's very important and I'm, very grateful to all of you who came to hear from our candidates and to ask questions. So that is it. I um, hope you all stay well and healthy. Thanks for being here and have a good evening. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 I am muted, everybody, so we can hear all our chatter. Bye, <laughs> Apostle Taylor. Win, win. <laughs> And I'm going to leave this open if anybody wanted to go in the chat room to download District 7, Apostle Taylor. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Okay, night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.